Good evening, everybody. How are you? Well, you can't answer. I hope you are all well. Uh, welcome to the last of our fall lecture series for 2023. As usual, I am Carrie Soden, the Archaeological and Research Director of the National Museum of the Great Lakes. Thank you all for signing up and showing up. And please don't forget, you can always donate online at nmgl.org backslash donate. Um, as I mentioned, tonight is the last of our fall lecture series. Uh, for those of you on Zoom, don't forget if you need closed captions, just turn them on with the control bar at the bottom of your screen. If you have any issues at all with the Zoom portion, please log, in, log out and log back in. That seems to fix most of the problems that users have. If anything were to happen to your feed tonight, please be aware we are taping this and we hope to have it up on our YouTube channel by Monday morning. And when it is up, I will send out a link to all registered participants um, to, so that we can be shared around. Uh, we will have a, a Q and A period at the end of the at the end of the program. Please put your questions uh, into the the Q and A uh, sample on your screen. Uh, huh. Tonight we get to hear about a project I have been very excited about for the last few years. I fortunately even had the opportunity to help with the documentation of one of the crafts that we're gonna hear about. Wisconsin's dugout canoe project began in 2018 with 18 known canoes. And I will leave it to the presenter to tell us um, how that has fared since 2018. Um, these canoes um, since 2018 have been fully documented by a team of scientists and archeologists, including 3D renderings, as well as offsets and a better under to help get a better understanding of the dugout canoe and and what is the evolution of it. Um, included in this range of canoes that they've been studying is the Great Lakes Basin's oldest shipwreck, a canoe that's been found that's dated to almost 4,000, if not over 4,000 years old. So to talk about this tonight, I'm very pleased to have one of the principal investigators of the project, Dr. Cecil Schroeder. Uh, Cecil is a professor of archeology span in, in the anthropology department at UW-Madison. Her research intersects with the humanity, her research intersects with the humanities, social sciences, and physical and biological sciences, and includes the investigation of ancient architecture, ecology, and the history of archaeology. She has received multiple awards and honors, including Society for American Archaeology Presidential Recognition Award in 2022 and the Chancellor's Distinguished Teaching Award. Among other appointments, she has served with the University of Wisconsin's Department of Anthropology Chair from 2016 to 2021 and Director of the College of Letters and Sciences Honors Program from 2012 to 2015. So needless to say, she's been busy um, if you're in academia to share those kinds of things, plus continue your own research is, is quite a feat. So Cecil, welcome, and I will turn the evening over to you. Thank you so much for that introduction, Carrie. I am going to um, start sharing my screen. Uh, Let's see. Okay. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be able to um, be here this evening virtually with you to talk about the dugout canoes. And I'm going to um, see. I'm going to stop my video, just make sure that you can you, you can focus on the presentation. Um, as, uh, as Carrie mentioned, in 2018, Tamara Thompson of the Wisconsin Historical Society, Ryan Smazel, an undergraduate at UW-Madison, and I started a project to study dugout canoes in Wisconsin. And when this started, it, it started because Ryan was interested in underwater archaeology, but he wasn't a diver. He didn't have enough time as a, while he was a student to learn how to dive. And so we thought this would be a manageable research project for him that could be accomplished in a summer and then you know, give him a semester to you know, kind of tie up the loose ends. And it would also help the Wisconsin Historical Society with its heritage management. At the start, we were aware of 11 dugout canoes in Wisconsin that ranged in age from 150 years old to 1,850 years old. And by the time Ryan finished his project, which ended up expanding into his senior thesis, we had documented 34 dugouts across Wisconsin. And then after Ryan graduated, 
And Tamara and I continued to locate and document dugout canoes, and we now have a sample of 95 dugouts that have been reported in Wisconsin. And we have documented 70 of them so far. And the week after Thanksgiving, we're heading off to document another one. We've got dates for 23 of these dugouts, and they range from 80 years old to 4,400 calendar years old. The oldest known dugout or shipwreck, as Carrie mentioned, in the Great Lakes. And it is also among one of the oldest dugouts in Eastern North America. On this slide, um, the, the uh, bars indicate the date range for the oldest dugouts that have been documented in Eastern North America, um, color-coded to match with the uh, colors of the flagship university in each state. And so you can see Wisconsin in red is um, among the, some of the oldest dugouts in, in Eastern North America. This quantity of dugouts puts Wisconsin second in the Eastern United States for the number of reported dugouts after Florida, where more than 400 dugouts are known with more just over a hundred of them coming out of a single lake. It also means that Wisconsin has by far the largest number of documented dugouts or reported dugouts in the Great Lakes region. What I'm gonna talk about this evening is based on our uh, statewide survey of dugouts from collections and institutions, as well as those that are known from bodies of water in the state of Wisconsin. We've been working on this project for five years and um, what I'm going to go through as we this the with this talk this evening is I'm going to go through some information that will help provide a broader global context for Wisconsin dugouts and what makes them significant. Summarize our historical uh, knowledge of dugout canoe technology and use. I'll describe the Wisconsin Dugout Canoe Survey Project, including our commitment to collaboration and engagement with our partners, uh, who are numerous, and also how we have been leveraging primary field research and collections-based research to significantly expand um, the, our knowledge of Native American watercraft and maritime history and really tell this larger story about a poorly understood aspect of ancient watercraft, and that is dugout canoes and in particular Native American dugouts. Dugouts have been found all over the world, any place where there is wood that is suitable for making dugouts. And the oldest securely, dug, securely dated dugouts in the world are shown here. And they all date to the early Holocene between about 6,000 years ago and 9,000 years ago. So far, dugouts have um, dating to the Pleistocene have not been found. And I just wanna draw your attention to a few of these dugouts, um, the De Leon Springs dugout and this, uh, this one from Japan and this one from China. And you can see that they all are fairly flat. They've got kind of a shallow draft um, and that, that is how they were manufactured. They did not have higher sides that have decayed off of them. That is exactly what they, what they looked like. Much of what we know about how dugouts were used and how they were made prior to the widespread introduction of European iron tools comes from written accounts of the 16th century Spanish and Portuguese invasions into southeastern North America and the French, Dutch, and English incursions into uh, the Northeast and Eastern North America in the 17th and 18th centuries. Uh, and, uh, and some of this information is you know, proven to be really valuable for us as archaeologists, but it needs to be assessed pretty carefully because a lot of these documents are pretty biased. But when it comes to their description of the manufacture of dugout canoes, uh, what they provide seems to be pretty, pretty, um, pretty much capture what was likely to have been the methods of production. In the mid 16th century, an Englishman named Thomas Harriet described the method of felling trees that native peoples used and so vividly described native in native americans making dugouts that the artist Theodore de Bry 
was able to make this illustration of the native peoples using fire, um, built, building up the fire around the base of a tree to fell the tree and then making a dugout canoe with the help of fire, stone hatchets and shells to hollow out the tree trunk. Now, it's really kind of interesting. The earliest um, stone tool in Eastern North America that shows evidence of heavy woodworking is a tool that archeologists call the Dalton Adds, named after the site in Missouri where these tools were first identified. These stone tools date between about 11,500 and 12,000 years ago, which makes them older than any known dugout in North America. Um, and so you can see on the image on the, the left of the Dalton ads, there's a, a sheen, a polish uh, at the cutting edge. And that is a, a kind of polish that's very distinctive to heavy woodworking. Um, the sort of woodworking that might be associated with felling trees or, uh, or and or making dugout canoes. In addition, in an analysis that um, Rick Yerkes and Brad Koldehoff did of um, residues on Dalton adzes, the majority of them had uh, charcoal residues that were visible on the adzes. And so together, um, I, I would say that the wear patterns on this distinctive stone tool type and the evidence for charcoal residues support the ethnohistoric descriptions that we have about using fire for felling trees and using fire in the process of carving out a log to make a dugout canoe. Now the absence of heavy woodworking tools in earlier Paleo-Indian assemblage, assemblages may indicate that Paleo-Indians um, relied on watercraft that were made of wood, uh, bone and skins like the kayaks and umioks that were used in the Arctic, and perhaps even some vessels like the bull boats of the Middle Missouri River Basin uh, that were um, documented um, uh, by Rudolf Friedrich Coors and other uh, travelers into the uh, Middle Missouri and Upper Missouri River Basin. And the bull boats were made of wooden frames and then had bison skins stretched over them. To our knowledge, the earliest documented iron tools in Eastern North America or in the Southeast were introduced by De Soto in the 16th century. But in Wisconsin, iron tools were not readily available until the sustained presence of the French in the 17th and 18th centuries. And once iron tools were available, they were very quickly adopted to replace stone and shell tools to hollow out a log to make a dugout, a process that leaves behind some really distinctive tool marks on the canoe's interior, as well as um, oftentimes on the exterior. Fire was still commonly used once iron tools were introduced, but it was not as essential uh, to the production process as it was when the tools were predominantly made of stone and shell. For many years, the Menominee tribe of Wisconsin had a booth at the Wisconsin State Fair, which is always held in Milwaukee. And they would sometimes demonstrate the production of dugout canoes or the, the process of making dugout canoes. And you can see kind of in the center of this slide is a not yet complete, but a dugout canoe. And it's just um, the, it's surrounded by bits and pieces of uh, wood that have been chipped out of the, of the dugout. Um, and then, uh, and, and they used metal tools in these demonstrations rather than using really traditional tools. And then at the 1893 World's Fair in Chicago, there was an Indian village that was created that included um, Potawatomi, Ho-Chunk, and Menominee. And in that Indian village, the Winnebago or Ho-Chunk demonstrated dugout canoe making with, with tools. And here is Carrie, a uh, little shout out for Carrie, um, with the dugout, which is at an antique shop in Michigan for sale, as you can see. In the summer of 2022, 
Paul Demain from the Lacoudere tribe in Wisconsin um, organized a project to build two dugouts on Madeline Island that involved various Ojibwe local residents and visitors to the island. And they too relied on metal tools to make the dugout. In 2021, Bill Quackenbush of the Ho-Chunk in Wisconsin worked with their tribal youth to build a dugout canoe using metal tools and fire. Um, and both of the, both the Madeline Island dugouts, one of them is shown, uh, pardon me, not shown here, but and Ho-Chunk dugout, which is shown in this slide, were put to use on the water just as they would have been in the past. And it's pretty, um, it's actually pretty fun. This, uh, the Ho-Chunk dugout, was launched at the north end of Madison. There are four lakes in Madison that are kind of chained together. And the Ho-Chunk and um, Ho-Chunk youth paddled that dugout through all four lakes and then into the Rock River and headed down to uh, Beloit. Um, and it was a like a week, it took them about a week to do that trip. Um, just as in the past, um, or just as in the present, dugouts were used for a lot of different purposes in the past uh, for important activities like basic transportation. Uh, and then early fur traders also used dugouts. Um, this is a, a painting by George Caleb Bingham of a father and his Matisse son with their wares in a dugout. And they are descending the Missouri River. And this, um, this painting has kind of an interesting backstory. I'm gonna give you like 10 seconds to think about what the creature in the front of this dugout reminds you of. To me, it looks like a cat, right? Um, but it's actually a bear cub. And that is more um, readily uh, discerned in a second later painting of the same scene that George Caleb Bingham did um, and of, of basically the same scene. And here you can more easily visualize the bear cub that they have. Um, dugout canoes were also used for fishing uh, and even whaling, which is um, certainly the most hazardous use of a dugout that we have come across. Dugouts were also used in recreation by adults as well as children. Uh, and um, so there's a wide variety of different ways that dugouts were used by people. And we get um, a really nice sense of the great diversity of use through these uh, artistic images. When we were um, working on this project, Tamara Thompson and I developed several research questions that we wanted to investigate through this study. One was how does um, canoe wood type vary across space and through time? Were softwoods preferred as is, has been documented across much of the world? Do, does wood type align with paleoecological records where those are available? How do the size, form, manufacturing methods, and other attributes of dugouts vary or are similar? Um, and then we also had a number of goals that we set for ourselves as part of this project. And um, first, was to basically identify dugouts, find them, locate them, and once we had them located, measure them and systematically document them. Also work on determining the ages of the dugouts uh, using historic records or radiocarbon dates. Produce 3D models of the dugouts so that the images could be widely shared. Most institutions that have a dugout or most collect collections that have a dugout in them, there's just one dugout. And there's a tendency for people to think, well, that's what dugouts look like. And through um, developing 3D models that people can interact with, more people can see the variation that we've been able to document among dugouts. We also have been partnering with Wisconsin tribes on this project in both field work and the documentation of dugouts. 
And we're trying to widely share the results of the study as well as the 3D models that we've been producing. So we've conducted um, primary field work in lakes and rivers around Wisconsin using whatever means of um, accessing the water that makes the most sense, uh, whether we're dealing with open water as the, is the case here where uh, in the upper left corner, Tammy and I are embarking on a survey of a river bottom adjacent to an archeological site. Um, super mucky, we both ended up face planting um, Tammy face planted at the beginning of our little trek in the river and I face planted at the end. Uh, I also just want to draw your attention to the boat in the lower left corner, the Dawn Treader. This is this year is the 50th anniversary of, of the Dawn Treader. So it's been a um, very good boat. It's served um, Sea Grant as well as the Wisconsin Historical Society very well. In addition to looking in open water, whether through diving or surveying along the bottom, uh, we've also undertaken survey across the ice. Uh, and this is kind of a, this is sort of a classic Wisconsin thing to do. Um, Bill Quackenbush of the Ho-Chunk has GPR equipment and he's, um, these are two images of us uh, undertaking survey across the surface of Lake Mendota where we know there are dugouts on the bottom um, to see if those dugouts can be identified with this kind of instrumentation. And if they can, can we use this kind of instrumentation to survey more of the margins of the lake? On the right-hand side, it's um, one of my graduate students, Miranda Washinawatok, who is Menominee is helping with the survey on what turned out to be the absolute coldest day of the winter. Uh, so everybody's very bundled up. And then on the left, we are back out there with a different, uh, different GPR on one of the warmest days of the winter where we waded through more than ankle deep, like calf, calf deep water and slush on top of the ice underneath. So just we're quite dedicated to the, the work that we're doing. In addition to the field work, we've done a lot of collections research and that is of course how this project started. And that's included archival work at the Wisconsin Historical Society, like these detailed notes on a canoe that was pulled out of Lake Wingra, one of the lakes in the Madison area. Um, and uh, an early director of the Historical Society, Charles E. Brown, made these detailed notes about this particular dugout. We've also looked at, um, at uh, photographic archives and this image of a canoe on the shore of Europe Lake in Door County, um, we can tie it to a dugout that is now in the Door County Maritime Museum. We also um, worked with a volunteer that does a lot of things with, uh, with Tamara to search through news, Wisconsin newspapers for any mention of a dugout. And we have a few uh, mentions of dugouts where we haven't been able to tie it to an actual dugout that we've seen. But this one that was recovered from Selmer Lake in, uh, in 1966 is in the Iola Historical Society today. And this dugout found in a lake in far northeastern Wisconsin in, again, 1966, um, is now in the collections of a museum in far southwestern Wisconsin, um, the Fur Trade Museum at Villa Louis in Prairie, Prairie du Chien. We have no idea how it got from far northeastern Wisconsin to far southwestern Wisconsin, but perhaps through some additional um, scientific research, we might be able to begin to figure that out. And then um, Tamara Thompson, my collaborator on this project, regularly dives for recreational purposes in Lake Mendota. She lives on Lake Mendota, the university is on Lake Mendota, the Historical Society's main headquarters building is on Lake Mendota. So we're, we're looking at Lake Mendota all of the time. And then she does recreational dives. And she was on a um, just a recreational dive with somebody that works for her. She was just kind of adding to that person's hours of experience. And they were swimming along, swimming along, and they were getting close to 
the halfway point and uh, Tammy saw the dugout that's in the upper uh, right corner on this slide, she saw it poking, you know, sort of one end poking out of the sediment on the bottom of the lake. And from the experience that she had gained from looking at dugouts in collections, she was like, oh, that's not just a log. I think that's a dugout. And so she wrote that on her whiteboard, showed it to her, um, her dive partner, and the dive partner is like tapping on her watch. Got to get back. Got to get back. We're, you know, I'm halfway out of out of um, uh, gas. And so uh, Tammy timed how long it took to get back to their boat. And then she came out again later that afternoon with someone else to uh, um, the uh, a woman named Amy Rosebrew, who's now the state archaeologist in Wisconsin. And she un worked on uncovering it. And yes, indeed, it was a dugout. And she took a wood sample and was able to get a date on it. And it turned out to be 1,200 years old, uh, which was like, wow, oh my gosh, that was totally, totally unexpected. She has continued to do dives on the bottom of the lake. And she found the um, dugout that's at the base of this slide that's 3,000 years old. Um, that was also found on one of her recreational dives. These two dugouts have been raised by the Wisconsin Historical Society and are now in a tank in one of their um, curation facilities as they are gonna slowly go through the process of being preserved. <clears throat> uh, and the remainder of the dugouts will stay on the bottom of the lake. We've looked at dugouts in collections across Wisconsin, in lakes and rivers in Wisconsin, um, but we've also looked at dugouts that originated in Wisconsin and are now in museums and collections in Nebraska, Washington, D.C., um, just it, actually in Maryland, just out of Washington, outside Washington, D.C., Chicago, and Michigan. Um, and these have all been road trips that we've done, so we've put a lot of miles on the cars. We record a variety of different kinds of qualitative or descriptive information on each duckout, including the presence of metal tool marks, which are really evident on this dugout at the Neville Public Museum in Green Bay. Thwarts, which some dugouts have and some do not. Uh, and we um, don't really don't really know why some were thwarts were used in some dugouts and not in others, but hopefully we'll gain additional insights as we continue to do our work. Many of the dugouts have evidence of burning, which was part of the process of both felling the tree and hollowing it out with stone and shell tools. Um, and then with some of the historic era dugouts, we've noticed the presence of guide or gauge holes um, that had been um, plugged with wooden plugs on some of them. And the first time we saw these, they were um, at the Wisconsin Canoe Museum, the Gustafson Canoe at the top of this slide. And we were looking at this dugout in good lighting and the people at the museum pointed it out to us as well. And then as we looked over photographs that we had taken of the Horde Museum dugout, which was very poorly lit, then we noticed them in that dugout as well. Um, these are holes that were drilled into the into a log to a certain depth to help ensure that the hull would have a uniform thickness. Once the holes had been drilled, they would be plugged with wooden dowels that often were dyed or colored so that they could easily be seen when the interior was scraped down to the intended hull thickness. This is a um, technique that we do not see on any native made dugouts. It's found only on dugouts made by Anglo-Americans. Some of the dugouts have evidence of patching with pitch or some other kind of sticky substance like oakum um, or uh, some of our favorites are ones that have been um, patched with tin or brass. And the Muskego Historical Society dugout in the upper right-hand corner was patched with the bottom of a, bass, a brass, um, brass bucket, which is really kind of fun and in interesting. About a half dozen of the dugouts have been painted. 
And some of them have layers of paint of different colors covering the exterior and in the and the interior, as you see with this, um, this image of the Gustafson canoe. And some may even have designs painted on them. So there's different colors of paint on the um, gunnel of this dugout or just below the gunnel of this dugout. And it's pretty worn, it's, a, it's difficult to see, but some of the paint is um, gold, some is red, there's some that's a, a dark gray and the white that is really, really probably most apparent. And it's possible that the paint, um, the design painted on this dugout at the Chippewa Valley Museum may have resembled the um, image or the paint job on this birch bark canoe. We also have two historic era dugouts that have designs that were painted on the bow, one at the Menominee Logging Museum, and then a um, dugout that had belonged to Chief Ackley of Mole Lake, uh, the Mole Lake Ojibwe or Chippewa group um, that is now at the Camp 5 Logging Museum in Northern Wisconsin. We've got a few dugouts that have a single hole in the floor or the bow of the dugout that typically doesn't go all the way through. The Douglas County Historical Society dugout on the lower right hand side in this image, um, the hole did not originally go through the dugout all the way. It was punched all the rest of the way out um, to probably hang the dugout, we think. Um, sorry about that. Uh, some of our working hypotheses about what these holes represent are perhaps a mast step for a sail, as seen in this replica dugout canoe that um, was, is it's a replica of one that Lewis and Clark used on their return trip from the Northwest, or possibly to secure a blanket to the bottom of the dugout that was then held up by a person uh, to use as a sail to help speed up the, um, the movement of the boat through the water. Or it may have held a flag or some other one, um, like this Ho-Chunk flag that we see in this slide here. In this slide, we've got an image of the use of fire for night fishing, and it's in the center of the dugout, not doesn't really make the most sense to put a fire in the middle of your dugout. It's more likely that it would have been, um, uh, the fire would have been on a pole that hung over the bow of the dugout. Uh, so we think this was, you know, some sort of artistic license, but that um, using a place to support a pole for fire may be another possible reason for these holes that we see uh, in the dugout. There are a number of dugouts that have horizontal holes through the bow and sometimes also the stern. Uh, and these may have been used with a rope to secure the canoes to something that was on land or near land. They might have been, they might have served to trim a sail if the, if the boat had, a, if the canoe had a sail. When they're found on both the stern and bow ends of a dugout, they might have been used to daisy chain dugouts to keep them together in fog, or if they were being used to transport a lot of goods. Or it's possible, as we learned from Larry Hadeen of the Miami, to accommodate, the holes may have been used to accommodate sticks that could then be used to lift the dugout and portage it. Um, these would, you know, these are heavy, uh, they're not as heavy as you might think, but they are heavy boats, and this would certainly make portaging them much easier. The holes could have also served um, to um, hold a rope used to drag the canoe, as seen in this sketch of an Oto dugout canoe by um, Rudolf Friedrich Kurz. We rarely find artifacts in association with the dugouts. We've looked at a lot of them and there are a couple that were reportedly found with fur trade artifacts. Um, but this, um, this 1200 year old dugout from Lake Mendota is an, a rare exception to this lack of associated artifacts. There are uh, five rocks in the, uh, in, in the dugout. And at first, um, at first, I think we thought, well, they're just, they just 
ended up there, but the bottom of Lake Mendota is not very rocky, certainly not with rocks of this size. Once they were recovered and brought up to the surface of the lake, Amy Rosebrew, who's now the state archaeologist for Wisconsin, noticed that the, uh, the rocks all had a um, little bit of notching on opposite sides, and they were roughly the same size and, so, and all were the same weight. And so we've concluded that these were net weights. Um, they were found clustered together. At the time that this boat ended up at the, in the bottom of the lake, there probably was a net that was attached to those weights and that has long since decayed away. We're starting to reach a sample size where we're seeing similarities among some dugouts and this might help us to identify shared practices here are a number of dugouts with a very particular bow style, and they are associated with the Menominee and the Ho-Chunk, or we aren't really sure what tribe they might be associated with. All of them date to the 19th century. Uh, most were manufactured in kind of the early to mid uh, 19th century, early to mid 1800s. Uh, and so this is something that we're gonna sort of delve into a, a little bit more deeply. We know that a similar style was used by Dakota and some tribes in Minnesota and Iowa, um, also dating to the early to mid 1800s. In addition to all of the qualitative and um, descriptive information we've recorded, we've also been recording quantitative data measurements as well as categorical uh, information for each dugout. Each dugout is measured using traditional maritime baseline survey methods to record the length of the dugout, its width, the depth of the of hold, and the dugout is sketched to scale on graph paper along with descriptive notes and um, pointing out any sort of interesting features that we might have seen on the dugout. In addition, we take wood samples from each dugout. Those wood samples are, um, we take them to the Forest Products Laboratory in Madison and have the wood type identified. We'll also send the samples in to get, uh, to get radiocarbon dates. And for some of the dugouts where we're not really sure what the origin of the dugout was, we'll do strontium isotope analyses and that will help us distinguish between a dugout that was made of wood from northern Wisconsin versus southern Wisconsin versus southwestern Wisconsin. As Carrie mentioned, we're um, doing 3D uh, models of each dugout. Uh, one of the approaches that we take involves using a GoPro to take about um, 300 or so time lapse photographs. And then these are. Um, input into a program called MetaShape Pro. This is a photogrammetry program. And the um, photogrammetry technology really improved significantly since we started the project in 2018. At that time, we had to run these models overnight. And so if Ryan was at an institution and he took a bunch of photographs of a dugout, he would come back to Madison and then set the um, set the models up to run. And if they didn't work out, he didn't know it until he was back in Madison. Uh, so this has been, you know, the, the fact that we can process these in an hour or, uh, or less has been a significant improvement. Um, another really interesting and significant technological advancement came with the release of the iPhone 12 Pro and subsequent Pro models as well as the iPad Pro. Uh, Apple embedded a LiDAR sensor in these devices and that turns them into handheld scanners. You do need to use a special app. We use an app called Scaniverse. It's a free app that you can download from the App Store. Um, and we use this to scan the dugout and create a 3D model. It takes us about 15 minutes to scan a dugout, and here I am scanning the uh, Menominee dugout that's at the Smithsonian Institution. Um, 
once the scan is complete, um, again, it takes you know maybe 15 minutes, it depends on how careful we are. But once it's complete, it quickly processes a 3D model that's interactive and you can um, export it into multiple file formats, including um, video, which can be shared immediately and uh, can be posted to social media by the institution if they want to do that. We also upload the models to a website called Sketchfab and users can interact. They can go onto this website, look for these models and interact, zoom in, zoom out, spin it around um, and look at it from any angle that they, are, that they want to. Uh, in addition, we can print 3D models. Um, this is a 3D model of the 1200 year old dugout that came out of Lake Mendota. And these can be used in educational programming, uh, which has been really you know, kind of a lot of fun. And in fact, Jordan, one of our team members has uploaded some of the 3D models of dugouts into a virtual reality headset which offers another way for people to experience the dugouts. You can just feel like you're really close to it, walk around it, look at it from multiple, uh, multiple angles. So we're still um, collecting data, uh, particularly we're still waiting on dates, but we do have some preliminary results that, I'm, that I can share with you related to the size of dugouts, the type of wood out of which they were made and what we know about age at this point um, based on the dugouts we do have dates for. Uh, dugout canoe width averages about 53 centimeters. They're fairly narrow. These, um, these dugouts are pretty narrow. Most range between about 35 and 65 centimeters. And in a study of dugouts in the Southeastern United States that was completed in the 1990s, it was determined that um, the dugouts in the Southeast averaged 51 centimeters in width. So what we're seeing is pretty consistent with the width information that was found in another part of Eastern North America. Uh, the intact dugouts in our study range from 2.26 meters to just over 11 meters in length. And you can see that that one that's just over 11 meters is sort of an outlier for our sample. They average about 4.3 meters and most fall between three and five meters in length. The shortest dugout in our sample is the Lake Mendota number three, which is, dates to 2000 years ago uh, and is 2.26 meters in length. The longest dugout in our sample is about 150 years old and was reportedly used by a trapper named Davidson to transport supplies from Chippewa Falls northward. Uh, and so there's some um, there's a really great range in the length of the dugouts. Uh, it's similar um, data also are found in the southeast where they um, tend to to also have a pretty broad range in terms of the length. Now, in the 17th century, Marquette and Joliet traveled the waterways of eastern North America, and um, this is a map of their, of their journey and, and where they thought they were. Um, and the map shows a Peoria village at the confluence of the Des Moines and Mississippi rivers. And there's a notation next to that Peoria village um, in French, about the size, it, it describes the size of the community. And in translation, it indicates the presence of 300 cabins and 180 wooden dugout, wooden canoes or dugout canoes of 50 feet in length or 15.2 meters. So longer than the longest dugout in our sample from Wisconsin. But for the Southeast, um, the um, dugout length ranges um, pretty widely, as I mentioned before, but the longest, longest dugouts reported in the Southeast, in this particular sample, there's just one, and it was 15 meters in length. And I'm aware of several other dugouts from the Southeastern United States that were also about 15, 15 meters in length, or maybe slightly more than 15 meters in length. 
So I'm going to go back to this, um, this image or information about 300 cabins and 180 canoes of 50 feet in length. If we make just a general assumption, this is an assumption that anthropologists often make about uh, when they're trying to calculate population size, is they will assume that each house or structure uh, housed five people on average. And so if this community had 300 cabins with five people in each, that would be 1,500 people in this village. And then if all of them were using the dugouts, if all traveled in the dugouts, if you've got 1,500 people um, traveling in 180 dugouts, it works out to uh, eight people per dugout. Um, and this is totally, this is a totally random sort of coincidence, but it's the same number uh, of people in this illustration of a, a dugout um, depicted in rock art from Pitch Pictured Lake in Canada. Um, and in Wisconsin, most of our dugouts are about a third of this size, um, a third of the size of the, the what was reported for the Peoria, and are perhaps better suited to carrying two, maybe three people, as we see with this um, these illustrations of dugout canoes from shell engravings that were uh, found at the Spiro site in at in Oklahoma. And um, these are the only two illustrations of dugout canoes that I know of for Missis the Mississippian archeological cultural tradition, which was found across the Southeastern United States um, between about AD 1000 and into early contact with Europeans. Um, and I just also want to point out the objects that are in the dugouts and remind you about the holes in the bottom of dugouts that didn't go all the way through. Uh, and this is another um, set of examples of how those or the purposes that those holes might have served. We've got a few working hypotheses about dugout length. One is that length relates to the, the use of the dugout. Another is that Dugouts, um, dugouts varied in size through time. Um, and a third is that the size of the dugout is related to the kind of water on which it was used. With shorter dugouts used on oxbow lakes and inland lakes and longer dugouts used on rivers and big water. So I'm gonna turn now to wood type. Um, this, this part of our study, I just really geek out about this. Um, I looked at a sample of 174 dugouts reported from the eastern United States that had wood type reported, along with other information. Um, and this does not include the ones from Wisconsin. This is excluding what we have from Wisconsin. And so for eastern North America, um, or east, the eastern, North, eastern United States, 92% of the dugouts, 174 total, were made of softwoods, and only 8% were made of hardwoods. Softwoods uh, are more easily worked with stone tools and are also relatively light in weight and typically kind of rot resistance. And in addition, um, pine in particular as a softwood has a, um, contains a combustible resin that facilitated burning as part of the manufacturing process, which made it quite a bit easier to work. As I mentioned earlier, we've been taking samples of wood from each dugout and getting them identified uh, at Forest Products Lab in Madison. And so far we've determined wood type for 39 dugouts and roughly two thirds are made of softwoods, but fully one third are made of hardwoods which really was a surprise to us. And this includes white oak, elm, butternut, and hickory. And this makes the Wisconsin assemblage of dugout canoes really stand out as unique with regard to wood type um, in terms of the diversity of kinds of wood that were used, as well as the significantly greater representation of hardwoods. When we plot the locations of dugouts based on the, the wood type, on a map of the 19th century public land survey data on witness trees, which gives us kind of a proxy for what the, um, what the vegetation 
uh, uh, particularly trees, looked like across the state. We see that there's a correlation between wood type and local forest ecology, with most of the white pine shown in white as white dots on, on the map. Um, coming from the northern part of the state, some from the eastern part of the state where the sandy soils support pine, um, and all of the white oak and most of the hardwood dugouts come from the southern part of the state that was characterized by oak forests and oak savannas at the time of the, um, the preset or the public land survey. Now, out of all of these, um, we were certainly surprised at the quantity of hardwoods or the, you know, the sort of the relative abundance of hardwoods in the assemblage. But one of the most surprising of these wood types was elm. It's, um, it's got an interlocking grain that makes it very difficult to work with. It's very difficult to split. Um, and uh, actually, I had an elm tree fall on my car just before Christmas last year. And making lemon out of lemonade, I uh, sawed it up and gave a segment to a colleague of mine who does a lot of experimental archaeology. And I asked him if he would mind working on it using traditional tools to see, you know, what it would take to work elm. And he, you know, he had it for a while, and then after like a couple months, he said, "Hey, that wood you gave me is awful. I can't work it." And I said, "Well, that was the point: is that elm is very difficult to work." So this is just really, uh, you know, gives us some really fascinating insights into the abilities of native peoples. Now, the elm dugouts that um, they all that are in our sample all come from Lake Mendota. They're all on the bottom of Lake Mendota or have been brought up, uh, actually all on the bottom. And they all date to about 3,000 to 4,000 years ago, um, a time span shown with the red box on the pollen diagram on the left. And the climate at that time was warmer and drier than it is now, indi as indicated by pollen, as well as oxygen isotope data of uh, or oxygen isotope analysis of sediment from the bottom of Lake Mendota. At that time, so between three and 4,000 or 4,500 years ago, this area was characterized by open oak savanna instead of closed canopy oak forests. And under those, um, the climate conditions of that time that supported a you know, sort of open environment for the oak trees, uh, oak begins to branch fairly close to the low on the trunk, fairly close to the ground, making the trees less uh, desirable for dugout canoes. And you can see that even uh, with the white oak that's on the left, as branches extend out, the core diameter of the trunk gets narrower and narrower. Um, so not really well suited for um, dugout construction. Elm, oops, sorry, elm on the other hand, grows on a straight trunk and it branches out high above the ground, whether it's grown in an open area or in a closed canopy forest. It's also possible that because of its interlocking grain structure, elm preserves better than oak when it's uh, waterlogged. We need to do some sort of testing of that, uh, of that hypothesis. Um, but in any event, the use of elm for several of the Lake Mendota dugouts at three to 4,000 or three to 4,500 years ago gives us some new insights into traditional ecological knowledge and technological abilities of native people. So far, we've got radiocarbon dates for 17 of the dugouts and historically documented dates for six. And the dates range from 4,400 calibrated calendar years ago to about 80 years ago for one of the historically documented dugouts. Um, so it's quite a it's quite an age range far greater than we ever anticipated. We were surprised by the 1,200 year old dugout from Lake Mendota, uh, and then oh my gosh, there were even older dugouts. So what did we learn through this study? Well, obviously there are way more dugouts in Wisconsin than what we anticipated. Um, 
Advances in technology between 2018 and 2023 have uh, made it easier and quicker for us to produce 3D models. These are gonna make calculating carrying capacity of each dugout a little bit easier. We can also take measurements off the 3D models. So when we make the 3D models accessible to more people, other people can in turn measure them and, and you know, maybe do their own calculations on the information we've provided. We've interestingly enough learned that photogrammetry using the GoPro time-lapse uh, photographs works better on some dugouts and the LiDAR handheld scanning works better on others. In particular, dugouts that have lead-based paint, um, LiDAR just doesn't seem to work with those at all. And that's some of the, that, that applies to some of the historic era dugouts that we have. Um, dugout length varies significantly, and we're hypothesizing that that might relate to the kind of water on which the dugout was used. Dugouts were typically made of locally available wood types, and they were made out of a wide range of taxa including hardwoods, when hardwood was the most abundant type of wood available. And then dugouts have a much wider range of dates than we expected. Um, so uh, reaching, you know, sort of to in kind of um, tie this all up, we also want to point out that even fragments of dugouts tell a story. Um, they can, um, we can learn something about wood type based on just a fragment. And radiocarbon dates um, are things we can also get from a fragment. Dendrochronology is another possibility. The dugout on, on the dugout fragment on the right hand includes the pith of the wood. And so we've worked with Evan Larson at University of Wisconsin in Platteville to cut a cross section of the wood and then look at wood rings, the width of the rings in the wood that will help us understand something about the climate um, leading up to the, the climate that existed when that tree was growing leading up to when the tree was cut. We couldn't have accomplished this project without the enthusiastic participation of many partners, um, so many partners. We are really lucky to have tribal and non-tribal people who've been super, super engaged in this project. And we've been fortunate to have the support of our institutions, the University of Wisconsin and the Wisconsin Historical Society, um, as well as the generous funding provided to me through the Wisconsin Alumni Research Foundation and the Vilas Bequest. And if you'd like to learn more about this project, um, you can visit my website where there are, you can click on images of some of the dugouts and it will take you to Sketchfab where you can look at the, um, where you can interact with the 3D model. So thank you very much for your attention. I really greatly appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, Cecil. Um, we've got some questions coming in. If you want to turn your camera back on and we can yeah. maybe talk through some of this. This is this is truly fascinating. Um, I will share with everybody that, you know, again, I, I did get to help with one of them. Um, I was introduced to the project as a whole uh, two years, year and a half ago when I moderated a panel on dugout canoes across the Great Lakes, not really knowing much about them and um, and, and took a lot from Sissel. Um, I want to start with, because I meant to mention this before, but Cecil brought up a lot here that I, I kind of wanted to point out. Um, some point earlier this year, I was approached by uh, one of the board members for the Toledo History Museum, telling me that they had a dugout in their <clears throat> in their collection and were we interested in maybe putting it, doing something with it. So first of all, I said yes, immediately. Um, so it is on loan to us currently for the month of November um, sitting out in uh, in our um, vestibule there. Um, for those of you at the watch party tonight, be sure to take a look at it. One of the things I am planning to do with this is a full documentation, like what Cecil has um, uh, shown us tonight with her with using her techniques. Um, I don't have the GoPro, but I do have a good enough phone that I can do the the lidar with with it. So I'm I'm excited about that. One of the 
few things, and again, this is just because we talked about it, that I did notice on our canoe, our canoe, the Toledo History Museum canoe, is that it does have a through hole in both the bow, like on a, a, a crossway, both the bow and the stern area. So there's a there's a connection there to some of what they're finding in Wisconsin, which I, you know, when you talked about that, I got I got a little excited. <laughs> um, so, okay, we've got a couple of questions coming in here. Um, this is, and again, this might be based on some of your um, wood data. How, is there any way to know how long a typical dugout canoe would have been in service? Uh, no, um, that's, it's a great question. Uh, it is, uh, they, they would have lasted a lot longer than a birch bark canoe. Um, one of the things that was done to help sustain them over multiple years was in the winter, they would be sunk into a lake uh, so that they would stay wet and not be exposed mm. to changing temperatures that might have led to freezing, thawing, and the fracturing of the wood. Um, but we don't have a really good idea of how long they might have lasted. Okay. Um, and I find that to be, I, I wasn't sure if I was, because uh, your, your co-PI is, is a personal friend of mine, I wasn't sure how much I could ask in terms of what I do know, but you mentioned it. There are quite a number of canoes that have been found on the bottom of Lake Mendota. Mm -hmm. I happen to know that they're all kind of in a similar area. Do you want to kind of speak to some of the theories that you guys are working on with that at all? Absolutely. They are, um, they're all found on a kind of a, a, at the end of a sort of bench, a, a shallow area that um, extends into the lake and then it starts to drop pretty considerably. And they're being found uh, between like 20 and 24 feet in, uh, in water. And the water levels today in Lake Mendota are controlled by dams. So they're higher than they would have been in the past. And what we think is that this kind of um, shallow bench that is underwater today at the time that these dugouts were in use was probably exposed. It was land and there may have been a village on that land. And then in the winter, they were leaving the, you know, they were putting the dugouts underwater on this slope. And some of them, they did not return to recover. Uh, and it's, you know, it's, we're looking at the, the dugout span more than 3,000 years. Uh, it's um, at, to this point, we haven't dated all of them yet. We still have a few more dates to get on some of the Lake Mendota ones. But it's, you know, over 3,000 years, every decade, every 100 years, you, you know, or every 500 years, every 50 years, you forget about a dugout or the person or family to whom the dugout belonged or that used it, maybe they don't return to the community. And so the dugout just stays in the water. Um, I, as you guys have been finding that, I find that interesting because it is something that we see on the Great Lakes, especially um, with warships. Um, that's kind of mm -hmm. what happened at the end of the War of 1812 with uh, mm -hmm. Perry's fleet. They sunk it on purpose as a way to sort of preserve them. Mm -hmm. um, there's a fairly famous shipwreck in Lake George known as the Radeau, which is the floating tortoise, that again, they had sunk on purpose and they actually sunk it a little too deep. That's why they didn't go back to get it. But the fact that, you know, people have been realizing and that you can preserve this um, over time by by keeping it wet and cold seems odd but at the same time like it works so it's yes. just i think it's excellent that you know that we realize that this is something that's been done for a while um i've got a, a question here um what do you know about the paddles that may have been used with these old canoes you have you ever really found paddles with them so we have one dugout that is a <clears throat> it's a historic era dugout that has a paddle with it that looks um, it looks a lot like a contemporary paddle, but it's just a little, the paddle part is just a little bit narrower. Um, the rock art image and the shell art, um, the shell engraving, those show paddles as well. And they um, sort of have long handles and then smaller paddle blades. Um, 
those are really the only kind of hints that we have about what paddles would have looked like. From some of the uh, Anglo-American artistic renderings of dugouts in use, we know that they sometimes were poled rather than paddled, uh, that somebody would stand at the stern and would use a pole to make the, to have the dugout move through shallow water. Okay. I like that. That makes sense. Which, as you're talking about moving through shallow water, sort of leads me to a question that I've been thinking about as we've talked about this. Most of these that you're looking at in Wisconsin are coming from your inland lakes. Mm -hmm. Are there any, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Are there any um, examples that were maybe used on the Great Lakes? Or was this something that was really a, 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 a inland lake thing? That is such a fantastic question. We don't know. <laughs> um, we, we think that most of them in our sample were used on inland lakes. It's possible that there are some that are in the Great Lakes in Lake Michigan or Lake Superior, and they just haven't been found or recognized. Uh, as sort of an analogy, there are dugouts that were used in the Gulf of Mexico and along the um, southeastern coast in the Atlantic. And those dugouts are lo longer than the dugouts that were used in the interior in the southeast. So we we know that dugouts in the southeast were being used on pretty big water. Uh, we think that they probably were used in the Great Lakes, but none have been found. Uh, the rock mm -hmm. art from the Canadian Shield uh, that it's a very rare depiction of a uh, of a dugout canoe with the um, what they think is a dugout because most rock art depicts um, uh, birch bark canoes and they are sort of a sideways C is how they are depicted and that long image with just a little bit of upturning at the ends is it's really distinctively different and that might be a hint about the big dugouts being used on um, a big lake in like Lake Superior. Right. And I was going to kind of ask about that, maybe with that 11 meters long canoe, if the, I, and I know that was a historical one. I don't know if I'm trying to remember. I don't think you said, but do you, I mean, was there a possibility that was used maybe on Lake Superior or Lake Michigan? It could have been. Uh, it's, um, you know, a small portion of its history of use is documented. <laughs> No, I understand. A guy named Davidson. Yeah. Because it was a, you know, it was used by a fur trader and fur traders, they weren't just making their way or it was up and down rivers. They were on the Great Lakes, Lake <laughs> Superior in particular. So it's very, very possible that that was also used on Lake Superior. Okay. Okay. We got the questions are coming in fast and furious and a couple of comments. Um, oh, Martin mentioned this is and this is what we were just talking about. One possibility for the dugouts with both stern and bow holes could have been using ropes to line the dugouts through rapids and shallow waters without needing to fully unload the craft. Um, lining uses the current to aid in maneuvering through channels and around obstructions and especially effective in moving up a stream. Mm -hmm. So it's, yeah, not just maybe carrying it across, but using a, a slew of them and using a technology as a way to kind of um, make sure they stick together and and use the water to their best advantage. Is that, am I yeah. sort of getting that right? Yeah, that's great. Okay. That's a really great idea. Um, I'm a, I'm a little excited here because I, I always like to know how far afield our, our projects are going. I have a, a question here from uh, a student at uh, Texas A&M. So we've got people logged in all the way from Texas. Um, Kim wants to know, does the presence of possible net weights on the one canoe affect your interpretation of what happened to the canoe, canoe at all? Would they have sunk the canoes for the winter with their nets still inside? You know, probably not. Um, and that may be, um, that dugout happens to have a hole in the, in it as well as in, in the bottom. And so it may have been something that was kind of catastrophically lost as they were coming in towards shore. It's not in the exact same area as all of the rest of the Lake Mendota canoes are. It's about a thousand feet away. It's at the same depth. So, okay. 
So that's again, there's there's so many questions here too because we just don't know, and and I that's part of what I think is is so interesting about your research. Um, here's something else interesting from Laurel. Um, do you know or do we know based on what we know historically, but then also with some some of the imaging, do the paddlers always sit or stand when paddling? Um, and her comment to this is supposedly the Hawaiians were the first sort of paddle boarders with their boats. Mm -hmm. Uh, so from illustrations that we have seen of uh, dugout canoes from the 1800s, uh, people look, it looks like people stood in them. And because they are fairly narrow and some of them are flatter, more like stand up paddle boards, uh, we think that they were, they were maneuvered with somebody standing. We do have some illustrations that show people sitting in the dugouts. The person who's moving the dugout is standing, but people are sitting in it. And then the um, two shell engravings, those individuals are sitting or kneeling. It's hard to tell um, because we don't see the, the lower body, um, but they're you know sitting or kneeling. So I think it may have depended upon the kind of water that somebody was in, um, whether they were paddling or poling. The, the dugout that they would stand, kneel, or sit. Okay. Um, and now here goes, we're moving from some of the research to a, a museum side question, and, and I can help a little bit with this. Um, uh, once a canoe is restored and displayed, does it require special chemical coating to be maintained? So just to, um, when a dugout is, or any wooden object is saturated with water, it, um, the cellular structure of the wood is going to collapse once that water is removed. And so we've been keeping the Lake Mendota dugouts in a, a water tank with a bio deterrent. And um, I don't know if it's already started or it will start soon. We'll be gradually adding um, PEG, polyethylene glycol, to the water to slowly replace the water in the cellular structure of the wood. And then that process may take three years and then the dugouts will be removed from the peg, shipped to Texas A&M, <laughs> interestingly enough, to be put into their um, freeze dryers because they have freeze dryers of a suitable size to, to do this. And then that will pull out the last remaining water and then um, the dugouts will be brought back and curated, or one of them will be put on exhibit at the new history center that's being developed here in Madison. Uh, we have looked at dugouts that have been treated with PEG in you know, some of the dugouts that we've looked at, and they've been overly saturated with the PEG. And so the, um, the wax then starts to slowly over time kind of drip out of the wood and so that requires some, you know, some cleaning and some maintenance um, to kind of replace what what drips out. But once the once they're treated with PEG, they should be pretty able to withstand um, being on exhibit for many years. And then what about the historic ones, the ones that haven't been uh, water inundated? So some of them are in really good condition and some of them are not. It depends to some extent on whether they were left outside and exposed. Um, the, uh, I think what we would say, what we've noticed is that if they are wrapped in a plastic tarping or something that doesn't breathe, that's not good. <laughs> so, yep. um, you, you you don't want to you want to put them in maybe archival paper that does allow the dugouts to breathe and that that keeps the dust off i'd say almost every dugout we've looked at we've had to vacuum because it was covered with dust it hadn't been covered up we've looked at one that was wrapped tightly in plastic and that one was um had decayed and deteriorated significantly more than it would have had it not been wrapped okay this is a now this is a museum question for me with all this work that you guys are doing obviously you're bringing a lot of um knowledge and awareness to the fact that that wisconsin has all of these dugouts um are you seeing some 
positive feedback from some of these organizations that are hosting them. So like, I know that Door County Maritime Museum, I believe has three of them. And from some of your guys' they were able to leverage some um, grant money to help fund some some conservation for that. I mean, it's, mm -hmm. are you seeing that around the rest of the state as well? We're, yeah, we're seeing that in some places, people are getting more enthusiastic and engaged with the dugouts. We've had um, a couple of dugouts that were lost. We had called multiple times. They were supposed to be at this at this location. They couldn't, you know, they just couldn't find them. They didn't have paper records that they were there or they had ambiguous paper records. And then because we kind of, it's not that we pester or badger people, but we're talking about this all the time, everywhere we go. So people hear about it. And then amazingly, somebody was clearing out the attic of some garage and there was the dugout, um, one of the dugouts that we were looking at. And so it's certainly making them aware that what they have is valuable in terms of um, it, what it, information it will convey about history. And so I think it's helping with, um, with preservation rather than thinking um, especially with fragmentary pieces, we know that a lot of fragmentary pieces in the past were just, they were burned or they were tossed because they weren't thought to have value since they weren't complete objects. And we're able to, you know, we're able to say, no, actually they are really valuable. Right. A lot of important information from <clears throat> fragments. Um, here's another question from Martin, and it will probably be done at this point because I think we want to wrap up and not take up too much of your time. Um, Martin noticed, you know, you, you did a lot of comparisons with um, uh, dugouts that have been studied in the East and Southeast. Mm -hmm. um, how do the Wisconsin dugouts at all compare to those that have been found on other continents and, and used in other cultures? So in terms of um size and appearance. So I, I pointed out the dugout from China, Japan, and um, De Leon Springs in Florida as being kind of shallow. And the Lake Mendota dugouts are all like that. And so they're, um, you know, we're looking at different continents there, certainly. And they're early dugouts, um, even though not all of the Lake Mendota ones are that, that old. So um, it's, and then there are others that are deeper. Uh, and so it, we're starting to wonder if there were some different technologies in how dugouts were initially made, like instead of splitting the wood or trying to burn out and create this fairly deep interior, was there an, another way in which maybe the outer rings of a tree were kind of peeled off, um, off of it once it maybe it had it had died and okay, so that yep. yeah yeah so that that may hmm. be kind of a different way but we see you know all of these different um shapes for North America and I would expect that we would see a similar you know if if enough were recovered and identified they might still they might span that same kind of range of shapes. Okay. Excellent. And again, this is the anthropologist in me that, you know, just kind of gets excited about watching um, technology happen at the same time across multiple cultures. You know, these these are not people that talk to each other, knew each other, even knew the existence of each other, and yet they're all developing a dugout canoe. And so, you know, it's, there are some things you sort of like, just kind of wonder how they all end up going in that same direction. Anyway, that's, like I said, the anthropologist to me kind of going off. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think um, I seem to have um, lost the um, the video. Hey, I've got to find the Zoom again. Oh, sorry. <laughs> there, there we go. I, I touched something on my on my desktop and it it changed it. Uh, so the question again. Sorry. Oh no, that's okay. It was I was just sort of commenting on the. The fact that, you know, multiple cultures across multiple continents are all developing um, a similar style of vessel um, kind of at the same it is time. Really, yeah, it is really interesting. In the um, and, and all kind of at the same time, it all 
so far seems to be an early Holocene development, yet we know that people had watercraft before that time um, in, because of, uh, so Australia was people, what, 40,000 years ago at a time when there were no land connections. It's thought that maybe wooden rafts were made for, for that, um, to traverse that, that open water. <clears throat> <clears throat> the peopling of the Americas. We now have an understanding that watercraft are implicated in the peopling of the Americas. It wasn't just people walking across a, a, a land bridge. Those watercraft have not survived, but people were coming from a more Arctic kind of climate. And so they probably were using skin and bone or skin and wood uh, watercraft rather than fully wooden watercraft like dugouts. And so in places where the, you know, I, th I think that the idea of watercraft probably predates the making of dugouts and that it was a, a progression in terms of people's use of the resources, wooden resources that were available to them. Excellent. I, yeah, like I said, anthropologists, that just, just kind of always gets me cool. Um, so I want to say thank you so much, Cecil. This has been an excellent evening and an excellent program. And I'm thank you. so super excited now to like get back into the museum next week and do the recording of our own, our not our canoe, but the Toledo History Museum's canoe um, to hopefully add to your knowledge base. And then, you know, don't get me wrong. I don't want to start a, a thing across Ohio documenting 95 canoes, <laughs> but, you know, maybe it'll help us hear about um, some more in this area. Yeah, that would be really cool because I don't think Wisconsin is the only Great Lakes state to have such a huge number of dugouts. <laughs> right. That's well, that's as you guys keep finding them. I'm like, this can't be limited to this area. So I think that that's fantastic. Uh, we just happened to be in the the timing just was right that um, Tammy's boss was willing to allow her to use some of her time to do this work. And I was on um, research leave for three semesters and had funding. Um, so it just kind of all came together that we could do this. And we're still continuing to do it, even though I'm back teaching now. I have one day a week that I can go out and look at dugouts. And that's pretty much what I've done all semester. <laughs> I know, like I said, I, Tammy, when I talk to Tammy, it's always dugouts all the time. Yeah. Dugouts, 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 but that's excellent. Um, so thank you so much for being here. Uh, for those of you online and, and at our watch party, this is the end of our 2023 lecture series. I, I hope you have enjoyed it. We have actively begun planning for 2024 um, and we'll have dates and topics coming soon. Uh, we are looking at uh, diverse topics such as uh, Great Lakes birds and birding, uh, the history of the Shenango fleet, and hopefully a, a shipwreck story, possibly on the Rouse Simmons, the, the Christmas tree ship. Um, we will, again, like I said, have that schedule out to you guys uh, early in the new year. For those of you that may not be members, don't forget, you can always uh, become a member. And now is a great time to join at nmgl.org backslash membership. And other than that, for all of you, thank you. Thank you for being here tonight. Um, and we will see you uh, in 2024 at our lecture series for then. And Cecil, thank, thank you. So you. Yeah, thank you so much. It was a privilege to be able to, to talk with you it, all. It was a real pleasure. Thank you again. Have a good night. Have a good night, everyone. Bye. Bye. <laughs>